treatment and in Mexico or the equivalent. They may, but you're not talking about a country that pays much attention to the very niceties of law. Now, what happens is immediately start adding up those zeros for his defense. I mean, just start adding them up. And it, it, it's, to me, the risk was there, huge risk. If he had talked to me first, I would have strongly advised him, don't do it. Do not do it. And particularly, do not go down there the way this attorney, Bob Semmels, who, who I worked with, who is now doing 10 years in prison, don't go there. Because if you go there outside the country, you now are vulnerable to paid informants will be there recording you, uh, maybe not recording something. In other words, okay, so, but he didn't know that they'd be following him? They, they got, got pictures of him at the Jungle Ass Strip with, with the Mexican actress before they met um, uh, uh, El Chapo. Well, then they may, have, they may have the rooms where they met or the place where the conversations went completely wired. They, they, so they, in that in that regard, then they call, even at the uh, Golden Globes the other night, that guy Ricky Gervais called him a snitch. In a bad joke. I don't know if you saw that. They basically, uh, even in Hollywood, as a joke, they're calling Sean Penn snitch. Do you know that? Yeah, well, I, you know, I have no idea about that. I, I you know, I, I don't know. I, I really, I don't read those. <laughs> Michael, you're going to, you're going to think I'm boring, but I, you know, I don't read the entertainment magazines or any of this. Uh, I, I, I'm addicted to homicides, murders, 48 hours, classic <laughs> files. <laughs> oh, very funny. <laughs> very funny. So you like to read. Do you ever go on blogs from the old days of crime scene photos? Remember the old pictures that were taken in the 40s and 50s that you could find online? You ever looked at those? Yeah, the photographer. He was wonderful. Willie Summers. Who, wait, 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 who, who was? Who yeah, was? The, 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 are you talking to me, who? Michael? Yeah, who uh, I remember there was a guy, Ouija, who went to every crime scene in New York City with a camera that shot in black and white. His pictures are still the best ever taken. Brains on the floor, blood, the guy over the table. You can still find them online. Remember Ouija, he had a police scanner. He got there before the, anyone else did. And he took the crime scene photo before the, they threw the tablecloth over the guy's head. Ouija, I think, was the one who got Arnold Schuster laying there, you know. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, nothing covering him. Amazing photos, so, terrible, yeah, but amazing. You well, know, you, you was a DE agent. I'm sure you didn't need a didn't need a camera to see what we're talking about the horror of what happens to people in the in the world of crime, or well, God forbid, what ISIS is doing today. A headline just came out a minute ago, Mike. ISIS recruitment exploding. Lawmakers are warning that the terror group is gaining affiliates faster than Al Qaeda. Michael, let's switch it to the bigger picture. If you were in charge of the war of terror, what would you do to stop this? Well, I lived, and you know, this is a terrible thing to say. You, uh, you just have to look at what actually worked. And I don't even know if it would work. But when I was stationed in Argentina between 1978 and 82, those were the years of the dirty wars. They call it the dirty wars because they had what they perceived as a terror problem. You know, people were kidnapped, people were killed, bombs went off. So what the Argentines did, now is now famous as the dirty was, is they would bust people, torture them, get uh, information as to who these people thought were terrorists, and whole families would disappear. Until Argentina became uh, an incredibly dangerous place to live from the police. I am not. I'm, I am not saying that America should do this. It's a. It was horrible. I mean, uh, it was the safest streets in the world because that's that was the policy. You didn't commit crimes. You, you know, and the police were basically serial. But the killers. terror was being conducted by the left wing, wasn't it? Uh, no, they were against the left wing, Mike. They were very right wing. In fact, no, 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 no. I, I mean, let's clarify what we're talking about. Until the right wing cracked down on the left wing with more terror. Uh, and, and eliminated crime in the streets. It was the left wing that was making the bombs go off and kidnapping, right? They were leftists, and then consequently what happened is... Right, and then the right wing, the generals, stood up and said, that's it, and, and they, they became even more terroristic, and that ended the terror of the left. But yes, that's a horrible story to tell. It's exactly what happened in Argentina. It's, by the way, what happened in Germany under Hitler. I'll be back in a minute. Well, two hours have just flown by. I've never seen anything like this. This is like the early days of radio when I get 
people on that we have such rapport. Michael Levine, are you still there, Mike? Welcome back to the show. My, Mike, let me clear up something, because your listeners are going to uh, come away saying that I am suggesting that U.S. do something like Argentina. And all I can say is I was horrified. When I was in Argentina, and, and a lot of this, what happened with me and these death squads is in the books, particularly the big white lie. And if you read it, you'll see that a big joke for the Argentine uh, death squads and cops was to invite me to, the, to see the homes of escaped Nazi war criminals. Hey, Levine, come with us. You want, you want to see Mengele's house? I mean, that's the atmosphere that I was living in there. No, and no, I never took it. I, I didn't take it the wrong way, Michael. You're on the right side of things. Believe me. I get it. Look at this story, Michael. ISIS burns fighters alive for letting Ramadi fall. As their fellow soldiers, so-called, the vermin of the earth, fled out of Ramadi and fell back to Mosul, they were rounded up in a town square and set on fire by their fellows in ISIS. Can you believe this, Michael? What kind of individuals were fighting here? Oh yeah, and so how how do you how do you defend against that? Well, in the United States, what one of my suggestions is because it's an almost impossible. You know, we're a, we're a free, democratic, liberal society. That's what we are. Uh, we believe in our freedoms, and I do too. I believe very much. I, Argentina was the safest streets in the world, but man, you, you didn't. Uh, it's the only place I've ever seen where cops walked at you with their gun pointed at you for uh, crossing a traffic line. And <laughs> yeah. All right, Michael, stay on the line because I think that we need another one more segment with you. You got a little bit at the top of the hour. You, I'd like you to come back on the Savage Nation, and then we're going to go to my lawyer Dan Horowitz to talk about uh, related issues with regard to my Supreme Court victory, which just came out yesterday in the radio industry. We are speaking with Michael Levine, D agent, author of The Big White Lie, been there and done that, about the Sean Penn story. Is he crazy or is he stupid? I don't mean Michael, I mean Sean. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. Now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It is Disco Tuesday on The Savage Nation, hour number three. If you just joined the show, in hour one I talked about I guess it's my victory in the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday. I didn't take the case there, but let us say an antagonist of mine who accounted for five years of my life took it to the Supreme Court after many losses, and he lost. And at the bottom of the hour, we're going to have my attorney, Daniel Horowitz, to discuss the meaning of that. And we talked then about court horror stories. I broadened it you know, beyond myself to you. Many of you have been inside the legal system. You've won and you lost anyway because it's a very difficult system in which to prevail. Even when you win, you lose in terms of the money and the time. And that's why the best advice anyone could give you is avoid court at all costs. And people with money know that, and they bury you with threats. Evil people in business threaten others in order to intimidate them to not fighting back, you see. And now we had on an hour two, and joining us again is DEA agent extraordinaire Michael Levine, author of The Big White Lie. Michael, welcome back to the show. We were talking about the crazy Sean Penn situation. Then we went into a bigger story, Michael. I have callers who want to ask you questions about the war on drugs. You were in the DEA when it was really fighting a war on drugs. Is the DEA still fighting a war on drugs? Uh, Michael, you know, it depends on your point of view. What happened to me after... Uh, the, the biggest cases in history, really, and uh, that's deep cover, 15 tons with the Mexican government, uh, with Manuel Noriega's money launderer, the Bolivian cartel destroyed by our own government. I, it, well, I had a few of those, beginning in Bangkok, Thailand, to Buenos Aires, to, 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 to Operation Trifecta, which is deep cover. 
what, what my career became was what the one two, two chances I had in my life to make cases that really would have made a big difference. I was dying to make cases that would make a difference. And they were stopped by our own government. And so what what I wait, wait, you mean wait, wait, you mean drug cases were stopped by our own government along the lines of the old Steven Seagal movies kind of thing? Uh, no, nah, nothing. This is real. Uh, you, you know, for instance, in Deep Cover, um, where I, we sent the video to Edwin Meese, the attorney general, of me making a drug deal with the Mexican government, uh, bodyguard of the incoming president, the grandson of, of another Mexican president in his Mexican colonel uniform, uh, and I'm promised on camera a wide open Mexico for my, my mafia. If this deal goes through, that goes to Attorney General Edwin Meese. Edwin Meese calls the Attorney General of Mexico and warns him about us, my undercover team. Now, Edwin, is Edwin, Edwin Meese blew the cover on you? Yes, uh, and it, it's in a New York Times bestseller. And if I was, you know... Now, Edwin Meese was Ronald Reagan's Attorney General, wasn't he? Correct. That's correct. A at the time, what was more important was getting NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, passed. So if you have an American team of undercover, not just me, we had a whole team playing, pretending to be mafia. If you have a whole team of uh, Americans being promised a wide open Mexico for drug trafficking <clears throat> by the government itself, and NAFTA was on the drawing boards, there was, you know, there was a great deal of sentiment against NAFTA. It never would have passed. So it, that was one of the reasons. Wow be killed uh, as well that's one of the reasons I don't glorify Ronald Reagan on my show believe me you know uh, people turn him into a god none of the presidents have ever been god they're only men but but you know Michael let's make this more interesting for me and everyone else here you are a Jewish kid grows up in in the Bronx and the neighborhood becomes black Puerto Rican etc and you learn to speak Spanish you learn Italian from your Italian friends you pose as a mixed blood Italian Puerto Rican drug drug uh, cartel, uh, an American drug leader, or so, uh, what a gangster? A mafia don. A, a right. mafia don. So when you when you go undercover in those days, every breath is potentially your last. Correct? I was a crazy. I was a little bit crazy as I look. No, I'm saying you're sitting in a meeting and they don't know who you are and they want to feel you out. And each breath, they're looking at you, they're smelling you, right? And and each heartbeat, you're a heartbeat away from having your brain, your brains blown out. So I want to ask a question about it. You live the existential life that people write about, read about. You walk the tightrope. What was that about? You were just, what, tempting fate or what? You know, I, I try. I wake up now. You met my wife, Laura, and I, I, I realize in the middle of the night, often, what a miracle it is that I came out of this. And, you know, you look, why, why did I do it? At the beginning, I had my, my baby brother was a heroin addict, and I believed all the rhetoric. You know, let's go get those people making drugs overseas. They're the enemy. They, my, my baby brother eventually committed suicide. We, right, I remember that. Now, wasn't he a cop? brother wasn't my son was my son was a new york city cop who was killed by a drug addict oh my god i'm sorry i didn't want to bring it up i remember that tragic horrible story right my god my leg just went weak i mean my right leg just got got weak what you've been through so michael you look back and you think what what did i do it for i know what i ended up doing it for at, at first, I was like any soldier. I was a, I came out of the military. I was a good GI. I believed in the chain of command. I followed orders. I believed in the righteousness of the war on drugs, that it was real. And then learned that it wasn't real. It took years to learn that. And when I did, all I could do to salvage my, that my brain, my emotions, my heart, my soul, was to use the drug war to target killers, to target people who were murderers. They were bad. And I got them for drugs, but they were, they were just, I felt like every time I put these, uh, Papo Mejia, the big white lie, he was one of the most prolific murderers in South America. I put him away for 30 years. And I felt like I did God's work. I didn't win the drug war, but I certainly felt like I saved a whole bunch of lives who would never know it. Now, let me ask you something fun, fun for the Savage Nation. This is scary stuff for most listeners. They're not believing it's real because they live in a fantasy world. Michael, most listeners to radio live in a digital world, an audio digital world, or they're online, and they don't understand what you're saying in some way. They think it's a movie. So let's say you're in 
Bolivia or wherever they sent you, and you're posing as this gangster.